What's up, X and YouTube? Matt A here. Today, we're going to talk about Diablo 4, specifically about the Spiritborn, the new class that's coming in the Vessel of Hatred. Obviously, this is a new class that's going to be released with the Vessel of Hatred expansion. We already know. And uh, so let's get into it. So the introduction was fantastic. The presentation was awesome. The trailer was really good. And the good thing about the trailer is Blizzard trailers are always good. But usually the, the trailers are a little bit more grandiose than the actual gameplay, than the actual class. Not in this one. In this one, the grandiose trailer actually matches up with the class very well. And by that, I mean, there are four spirit animals or four spirit entities or spirits that you can draw from. A gorilla, a jaguar, a centipede, and a eagle. And when you summon these things or draw powers from these things, you actually see them in real time and they are giant. These are giant creatures that take up a large portion of the screen. So when they show, when you see in the trailer, a big old gorilla, centipede, and eagle, it's, it's not uh, exaggerated. It is huge in the game. So it is a really good spectacle. They did a great job with the effects and the, and the artwork with that. Everything with this class is great. It's kind of like if you took a monk and a druid and you put them together that's basically what this class is and you'll see that you'll recognize it right away especially with the gameplay especially if you played a monk as your main character you will recognize that move those moves you will recognize the way the fluidity of it and the class is very smooth let's talk about the introduction okay so they're gonna have to retcon some stuff and the retcon basically is that Akarat, you know went to the land and he discovered the spirit realm. So Akarat went to the land. Akarat went to the land. He discovered the spirit realm. And that's the retcon. And the spirit realm has been there to guard, guard sanctuary. It's supposed to be there to prevent corruption. And the controversy is if it's supposed to prevent corruption and guard, and, and guard you know, the earth guard, I mean, guard sanctuary, where has it been all this time? The spirit world wasn't there when, you know, Diablo invaded. It wasn't there in the Sin Wars. It, it wasn't there when the Burning Hells and the Heavens first discovered Sanctuary. So that's that's a little bit of the controversy, the retcon of it. You, you'll have to reconcile that with headcanon. I don't know how else, you know, you're going to retcon, you know, you're going to reconcile that. That believed in the human experience and that it gives us this unique power. We have this light within us. Um, and that light gives us the ability to question and to doubt and to challenge. Um, when Akrat made his way to his mother's homeland in Nahantu, he felt this strong otherworldly presence. And he would spend a lot of time with one of his um, apostles, Isavete, trying to uncover what this mystery was. What was this feeling when he got to the realm? or when he got to the land of Nahantu until he eventually discovers this veil. And that's the veil between the spirit realm and sanctuary. Um, and he realized that this was this untouched place from neither angels or demons. They had never really had any sort of influence there. Um, so Akrad and his dedicant Isavete would spend a lot of time studying and he would be the first person and living being to cross this veil. When you're playing Diablo 2 now or Diablo 1 or Diablo 3, you're just going to have to kind of go with it, right? You're just going to have to be like, okay, there is a spirit world. They do mitigate that a little bit by using Akarat. And it does help because they do mention in the lore that humans, demons, and angels don't, didn't really know about this realm. Except for the spirit, bo spirit born, which came, you know, down the line from Akarat. So it does make sense. They tried to make as much sense with it as they could. They tried to do it the best they could. So that, that was a pretty good job. And I would say... They did mention that when Mephi Mephisto was there and he corrupted Kurust in Diablo 2, he could sense that there was something else there, but his powers couldn't reach it. His corruption couldn't reach, reach this world. So we never discovered it. So I'm guessing in this expansion, this one, he is going to discover the spirit world. So the spirit realm is probably going to be discovered by Mephisto. And that's probably going to be a major plot line, it seems, with the corrupted soul stone that Nayrell has. So that seems where the plot is going. That's how they weaved it in. That's the introduction to it. So let's talk about the controversies. One of the contra controversies is obviously the retcon. 
The other one is, is this class taken away from the Druid class? Because the Druid can already, you know, summon creatures and, and have that kind of gameplay. And the other controversy that I can see, the only other one that I could see really, because everything else looks good. You know, the itemization, the skills, the animation, everything looks good with the class itself. There's nothing wrong with the class itself, but there's no Paladin. And it's not just the fact that there's no Paladin. It's the fact that there's no archetype that replaces the Paladin. So something just feels off. When I, when I first started playing Diablo 4, and ever since I started playing Diablo 4, something just feels unbalanced. Something feels off. That's because there's no Holy class. There's no Shield class. That feels off for a Diablo game. For a medieval setting, for a Diablo setting, you should have some kind of Shield class. Not just use shield occasionally, like a necro maybe, but like an actual shield class. So we're missing the whole, we're missing the holy class, the holy archetype. We're missing that sword and board gameplay. We're missing, you know, we're missing smite. We're missing, you know, calling upon the powers of Zacharum. Zacharum is great for lore. It, we understand it. You know, it has an integral part in the story, especially with Mephisto. What's the Paladin's? What's the Paladin's name? Karthus? I think so, because they he they have him as a quest, and you know, in D four, you go do that as a quest. So if Karthus is the one that you know a Paladin slain Mephisto the first time, you would think they would bring the Paladin back for it the second time, but they are caught up on this thing where they want to do something new, something new, something new, and I understand. That's the positive about this, that the spirit realm is necessary. And hear me out. The spirit realm is necessary because how many story arcs, how many storylines can we really have in hell and heaven and sanctuary? There's only so many storylines you can do. So much interesting, you could so much interesting stuff you can do. So many characters you can have. But the spirit realm lets gives the developers freedom, the writers freedom to create all these new quests powers and stories books you know maybe even you know digital media and new lore so it gives them all kinds of creative outlets that they can you know draw upon where they don't have to always use diablo 1 2 sin wars and all that stuff this is their way of continuing the series forward it is necessary so i'm okay with it i agree with the spirit realm it's just going to be hard to reconcile that with the past Diablo games and uh, retcon it with your head cannon. Now the Spiritborn can use two different weapons. They are two handed. So you're going to have a glaive and a staff. The staff is kind of a, a faster attack rate, but it does have some blocking capability, which is good. So it's more of a defensive weapon. So they are kind of giving you a little bit of that shield gameplay, only it's with a staff. They also have a glaive and the glaive has blades, obviously. So that's really good because at first I was like, I don't want to play a staff character because staffs are too passive for me. They're, they're too defensive. So there is a glaive there there. You can play the class with the glaive and it has critical hit damage and it has more offensive capabilities. So the glaive is going to have offensive capabilities. The staff is going to have defensive capabilities with attack speed. And obviously, depending on what skills you want to use, you might even want to use the staff for the attack speed for to synergy with other stuff. But the glaive is obviously going to be cooler, in my opinion. So you have a glaive, you have a staff. Each of the spirit animals, or I should say each of the spirits, has their own set of skills to draw upon, like a druid and the bear. Um, Jaguar is, as we've kind of touched on before, it is sort of this manifestation of just like the hunter. Uh, it's exhilaration, it's violence, it's aggression. Um, it's attacking repeatedly, kind of just constant pressure as it's going. Um, it's got these ramping mechanics to it. It's got lots of kill streaks. Uh, mechanically speaking, uh, the way we've kind of translated this, its primary focus is attack speed, uh, and it chases that through a new keyword in mechanic that we call ferocity. Uh, this is a stacking buff that it can generate, usually via Jaguar skills, uh, that will increase the attack speed of all of its skills. Uh, but it will also enhance other Jaguar skills so you can use them more often, reduce their cooldowns, that sort of thing. So the Gorilla, the Gorilla, uh, 
core concept behind protection and defense. Um, but it's not just like passive defense. This is a, a very active defensive play style where you're shrugging off the damage, but you're also returning it to your attacker. Uh, so it's really got this kind of core of like retribution also sort of built into it. Uh, its core mechanic uh, and stat that we work with is damage reduction. Uh, it chases us in two ways. Uh, one is through uh, using block, sort of actively blocking damage, uh, as well as a second new keyword and mechanic called resolve. Uh, this is also a stacking buff, but this one falls off whenever you get hit. Uh, so it's really important to keep stacking it and kind of keep stealing yourself and building your resolve back up. But as long as you have any stacks of it, you get the full damage reduction bonus. One last slide. Absolutely. Take us through the eagle. Yeah, so the eagle. Um, kind of soaring above it all, we've got this this uh, guardian that represents precision and accuracy and kind of finesse. Um, its ability, its freedom of movement, like a lot of the movement that the class has is very aggressive, very in your face, and the, uh, the eagle really is able to kind of take that to another level and kind of go wherever it wants. Uh, in addition to that, it can also sort of like extend its attacks to sort of pseudo range play style. It allows it to really like prioritize a target and sort of like hit from anywhere. Uh, so its core stat that it cares about is movement speed. Uh, that allows it kind of, like I said, able to kind of go anywhere it wants and sort of tactically reposition on the battlefield. Um, uh, and that is the centipede. So Bjorn, uh, how's the centipede play? Yeah, so moving to the centipede. Uh, the centipede is very unique. Uh, it represents this sort of abstract concept of the cycle of life and death. And the way we've kind of chosen to interpret that uh, is that it's sort of this epicenter of attrition. But it's also like really about just kind of like this endless or inescapable sort of persistence. Um, and that's like really bad for your enemy, uh, but kind of really good for you. Uh, so it kind of, it's core mechanics that it works with, uh, with that persistence is damage over time, poisoning, crowd controls, that sort of thing. But then it uses those things to sort of empower and sustain itself. So also like leeching life and that sort of thing back to you, sort of draining your enemies as you kill them. Uh, so moving on to just a quick example, uh, Stinger is our core skill. Uh, for the centipede. Um, this one does a large amount of damage in a small area in front of you, uh, but the sort of interesting thing about it is that that damage will also echo out to any nearby poisoned enemies. So it kind of has this adaptive, like, dynamic aim, like range that it has, sort of depending on like how much you've been spreading your poisons around the field. Uh, so it can like basically like hit the whole screen if you really want to. Um, another skill example that we have would be Scourge. Uh, Scourge kind of takes that sort of like oppressive control that the centipede has uh, and it will fear and it will slow and poison enemies and sort of disrupt any kind of like strategies they might have going on and just sort of allow you to turn the tables on them. And then finally uh, we have the ultimate skill bringing in the centipede itself onto the battlefield. This is the devourer. Uh, poison laser beams, globs of poison everywhere. Um, just the centipede kind of wrecking the entire battlefield. It's got upgrades which will also allow it to uh, instantly execute enemies who have been fully poisoned, sort of helping the cycle of life and death to speed up a little bit there. <laughs> yeah, this is clearly our most Diablo uh, guardian that we have. So if you're using Jaguar skills, it's gonna draw on the spirit of the Jaguar, which is fire. If you're using a gorilla, you're gonna draw on the spirit of the gorilla, which are defensive skills. Uh, barriers, overpower, you know, things like that. If you're using the eagle, you're going to draw on attack speed. You're going to draw on mobility, attack speed, positioning in the battlefield. You're going to have like the, they, they show some of the attacks, like a feather attack where, you know, it loops around and comes back, which is really cool. I like that. That's probably going to be OP. And finally, the coolest thing that they did. Now, this is really, really cool. Okay. And everybody is probably going to play this because it's the coolest. It's just the coolest thing. It's actually a centipede. When you're thinking of spirit creatures, you, you never think of a centipede. That is so cool. Props to them for that. This is the coolest thing in Diablo. The coolest thing that they've added to Diablo 4 is a spirit centipede. And this thing is huge. When it comes on the battlefield, it, it shoots out poison. It has an ultimate ability where it just it pops on the battle. You see this giant centipede shooting out poison. It's great. And all of the centipede skills are poison based. That's really cool. Because I think overall poison is underutilized. So it will be really cool having, uh, you know, the centipede skills to have the poison attacks.
Now, during this reveal, they didn't show the skill tree completely, but they did show off a lot of the skills. So they did show off some of the Jaguar skills, Gorilla skills, the, the Eagle skills and the Centipede skills. The Centipede skills obviously stole the show. The Centipede steals the show because it's so unique and so odd. Having an Eagle, yeah, okay, we expect that. Having a Jaguar, okay, typical. Having a Gorilla Spirit, okay, typical. Having a Centipede, I mean, dude, that's just cool. You gotta admit, that's pretty cool. So overall, I give it an A+. Plus. I give the class, it's the class itself, okay, is a 10 out of 10. The class itself. Because of the controversies, I would say that the whole edition goes down to a 7 out of 10. And I would say that the presentation is obviously a 10 out of 10. Blizzard presents everything amazing. We do get to see some of the skills have synergies. So you could synergize, you know, Jaguar synergizes with Eagle. Eagle synergizes with Gorilla. Gorilla synergizes with, you know, Jaguar. And they go back and forth. They cross synergize with each other. That's part of the skill set. No, for as far as I know, like no other class really has synergies like that. In some way they do, you know, in some way the sorceress does and, and, you know, in some way, you know, other classes do kind of synergize, but not in this way. So they do have synergies. And what that makes me wonder is, are they adding more synergies to other classes like they did in Diablo 2? Are they adding synergies in this expansion? I hope so, because that was one of the most interesting things about Diablo 2, because you you have to pick certain choices certain skills can lead to certain metas based on the synergies. So if they add synergies, that'll add a whole nother set of dynamics with the game on top of the uniques, on top of the legendaries. You'll get all that. You'll get that ability, you know, to make your own class and have more dynamics with the gameplay. Because if they're not adding room words, they're not adding charms. What else could they add from Diablo 2 that Diablo 4 doesn't have that would add dynamic to the gameplay and skills? Synergies. So my theory is that there are going to be more skill synergies with all the classes that I, I believe that's going to be the expansion with the skills. I don't think we'll see too many skill changes, but I do think there, there might be synergies. There might be synergies with these other classes which would be cool. If they do that, that would that would be great, right? That would be great if they do that. Let's just say that like with most classes they first introduced, this class seems really OP. They also showed off a little bit of the itemization. They showed off some unique weapons. And let me just say, we all know this, but the class is going to be OPAF. They always do this with a new class. They always make the new classes OP. So everybody wants to buy the expansion. Everybody wants to play this class so they can get the OP skills. We have the Eagles, the Gorillas, the Jaguars. Everything's going to be OP with this class. You better believe it. You better believe this class is going to be OP. You can already see from the gameplay. You can already tell it's going to be OP. But that's not a surprise. They do that every single time they add a class. It's always been that way. Well, not always, because in Diablo 2, when they added the Druid, the Druid, the Druid sucks. Still the worst class in Diablo 2, honestly. Um, well, the Necro isn't that great either in Diablo 2. But aside from that, usually when they add, you know, a class, it's usually OP. At least that's how they did it in Diablo 3. You will see, you will see the gameplay, you will see the skills, and you'll notice one thing that it just reminds you of the monk. They tried to sidestep this issue. They tried to get around the fact that this looks almost exactly like the monk gameplay. And they do show behind the scenes, which is really cool that because we've never got to see this before for a Diablo character, to my knowledge, they show the animation, they show the artwork, they show the design, they show all of the concepts behind the scenes, how they develop the, 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 you know, the move sets, they kind of develop their own, their own martial arts that looked really cool based on some real life martial arts. So it's kind of like a mixture of different martial arts to get the move set, to get the, the, the skills. And it's very, very fluid. The gameplay, the character, the animations, everything's fluid. Like I said, this class is a 10 out of 10. It just has some slight controversies with it.
how do I personally feel about it? Bittersweet. Bittersweet. That's how. I like the class. I want to play it. I'm going to play it because you know, I want to play the centipede. It's so cool. But I I can't help it, man. I, I miss the paladin. It's just, it's just something missing. And it's the paladin. If they could just fast track the development of the paladin and, and add it as a DLC, you know, season seven, we get a DLC. We could we could just buy the paladin. I, I don't care. I, I just want the paladin. Fast track it. They'll make a boatload of money too. So that's my message to Rod Ferguson and the dev team. Hey man, just just fast track the paladin. Make it a paid DLC. I don't care. I'll pay for it. I'll pay thirty dollars for it. Just just make the paladin. You don't have to make a new expansion for it. You don't have to do anything else. Just make the paladin class. Put it for sale. Let us buy the paladin so that we we have the paladin gameplay. And I think from a game development point and a uh, overall game design, that shield class is missing. I've never played a medieval type game or a fantasy RPG game where there wasn't some kind of shield class. So you can tell me if I'm wrong on this. Let me know what you think in the comment section below. I will try to respond to everyone. Let me know your thoughts. If you have any controversies with this, if you're okay with the spirit realm, do you like the way the class looks? Do you think it's just a rip off of the monk? Let me know. Tell me what you think about all that. This is the video. Hopefully you enjoyed my take on things. Like I said, I'm just the average gamer, average perspective from someone who doesn't deep dive into lores. Hopefully you enjoyed the video from an average perspective, you know, from someone who's a Diablo veteran. I know I didn't really go in and break down every single detail, but I just wanted to give my perspective, my interpretation of things, what I think are going to be controversies and how I feel about the whole expansion, just as a Diablo player. If you liked the video, go ahead and like it. Thank you.